The Worldly Gig is presented by The New Group and associated with Lisa Matlin. And uh, everyone, please help me welcome cast and creatives from The Worldly Gig. And so uh, I guess we should go down the line here. We have uh, Norbert, Norbert Leo Butts, of course, and Dolly Wells, Zasha Mamet, um, Hamish already raised his hand, and then artistic director uh, Scott Elliott. Um, I want to start with the the concept of the show, Hamish. Like, where did this even come from? Uh, I, I, uh, d I, d <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, I don't know. Take I, your time. I, I, I started writing some scenes with some people in it and uh, had a really good idea for a play, and then uh, it fell apart, and I put <laughs> it, uh, those scenes away. And, uh, How they, long ago was that? Uh, that was about four years ago, and they moldered and festered, and then um, I uh, pulled them out of the drawer, and I was shooting a movie in Richmond, Virginia, and yeah. I had a lot of time on my hands. I had too small a part, uh, but I uh, <laughs> then suddenly uh, this play uh, filled up the rest of uh, like uh, 10 days uh, by the river, and um, oh. it came out. And uh, yeah, that's how, I, that's how I wrote the play, I think. So that's how, but why? Why did I write the play? Uh, because I had too much time on my hands in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, no, I think uh, the play is sort of, uh, it's about loss to a degree, and I think I probably had experienced some loss, and uh, it was giving me a rash, and I needed to <laughs> scratch it. And uh, so I scratched it with my pen, and out of that ooze came <laughs> oh, the play. Lord. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the playwright should shut up. <laughs> I want to just let he you. He writes on. very well. <laughs> oh yeah, the the show I saw it Friday night, which I think was your second night open. Uh, incredible. Um, I just want you to keep talking, though. You're <laughs> you're uh, quite interesting to listen to. Um, <laughs> So oftentimes it takes, of course, years of writing. You said it was four years ago when you were down shooting in the wonderful hills of Virginia. And uh, writing development, and we get, to, we get the show through workshops and then through Off-Broadway and then to Broadway and the whole process. Uh, I, I know you're not on Broadway, but... Um, yet. 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 Uh, what, did, what was the process? This is still for uh, creatives here. How, Scott Hamish, like, how did... You finished up the script. What was the timeline? How did it bring? How did Scott you get involved and being like, yes, that's what we want. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I read a lot of plays every year. You know, having to pick uh, pick a few to produce, and um, you know, Hamish's agent, I guess, sent us the play, and uh, I read it, and I. I don't know. I had like an experience while I was reading it. It was one of those ones where I found myself laughing and then I couldn't stop crying at the end. And so I, you know, that, that just that reaction made me say, OK, I have to figure out a way to do this. It's a very complicated play for those of you who might come check it out just um, in the, the logistics of the whole thing. And it took me a minute to figure out how to do it. And then um, and then I just decided to do it. It was not a hard one. It was not, it didn't go through a million workshops or it was, you know, we did, I think, one little workshop uh, and only Zasha was in that workshop and Zasha, I think, fell in love with the play just the same time I did. We, we had a love affair together that weekend and, uh, and we decided we were going to do it together uh, over a year ago and, um, and it just was, you know, one of those plays. I, it's just, you know, I, I love stories that are, you know, are small and relatable, but are about big things. And that's what this uh, play is. Anyway. You said you wanted to figure out how you were going to do it. Uh, it. Did you mean physically in terms of, of the stage itself? Because whirly gig, I mean, what is the definition of a whirly gig here? I for I I've forgotten. <laughs> well, I've got it right in front of me. I was, set, I was setting you up. Uh, it is a one noun, uh, a toy that spins around, for example, a top or pinwheel. Two, a thing regarded as hectic or constantly changing, such as a whirly gig of time. So 
the the characters in this play all seem to circulate around each other. They've got past lives, and then their present lives have all brought them back, which is, you know, I, the term I coined, you know, full circle, everything comes back. Um, but then the stage itself is also, it's a turntable. It's a whirly gig. Right. So is, right. is there, when you said how you were going to do it, did you mean in terms of uh, well, what, I mean, how you're going to bring it on? It doesn't just have a turntable. I mean, that was just uh, something that I sort of envisioned that wasn't in the script, but it also has like people climbing trees and things like that, which seems almost impossible. And uh, mm -hmm. just trying to figure out a way to do that, um, you know, uh, you know, artistically, poetically, and, uh, you know, within a, a, a budget, <laughs> you know, it became very challenging. But then my set designer and I, uh, Derek McLean, uh, came up with um, some ways to do the little tricks in it. And, you know, the play is, uh, is, it sounds depressing, but it's very, very fanciful and charming. And it, and I think that's what, and I wanted to just to get that feel and the turntable helped uh, help me sort of, you know, create some surprises in the sort of visual life of the of the story. It's interesting because when you when the audience loads in, the, one of the actresses is already on stage and she's been sitting there spinning for how long? How long? Like That's why she's not here today. <laughs> she's, she's nauseous. No, uh, no, she's a delightful young actress, Grace Van Patten. You will hear a lot about her mm -hmm. very soon, I imagine. And and, uh, and yeah, no, I just wanted uh, you know because it's about a girl who is losing her life, and really, you know, as I watched the play five times this week, you know, it, it seems that like. The play, you know, a, a, a young woman is losing her life, and that's what sort of sends everybody into this sort of whirly gig of, of life, and uh, and they emerge, you know, um, grown. I think, and that's uh, that's the, the sort of moral of the story, right? So Norbert and Dolly, how did you two get attached to it? Though it was cast without me, and then I very luckily came in quite close to the opening because the person that had the part was then not able to do it. And I read the play and felt incredibly excited but was not going to let myself get too excited because I thought I'm going to at the end of a very long list. But, and that's what happened. And we had had a drink once before. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what, you you wanted and I think that's why you wrote the continue the relationship. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Almost as much as you did. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, what about you, Norbert? I, uh, I, I, I just met Hamish once or twice, uh, and just to have uh, t to know Hamish is to sort of fall in love with him. And and uh, I've been a huge fan of his work as an actor. He is um, one of my favorite working actors in New York City. Um, I've seen him several times on stage. He's quite brilliant. And so when he sent me an email with a play attached to it, I was a little bit. Uh, you know the the actor slash playwright. Uh, there was a little bit of of an eye roll, maybe a slight eye roll, like uh, oh god. <laughs> uh, here's another dilettante uh, writer, and uh, was quickly uh, realized this is a real writer, a real writer. I couldn't believe, and I I did so with some major jealousy. How could someone be uh, such a good performer and, and write so beautifully? I fell in love with the play uh, on first reading, and um, Hamish said he had just had me in, in mind for the role, and uh, I, I just jumped on. I think, you know, there's a tradition of, of actor playwrights, um, and I think Hamish really does. I think he kind of joins the Tracy Letts, Bruce Norris, um, a s s school of of contemporary actors who who write not because um, I don't know I could be wrong because they uh, need to to prove that they can do something else besides active. Like I said, he's a real writer. But the joy of doing a play by a, someone who is an who, who is an actor as well. Um, so much of the word is already on the page. It's very actor friendly. It's a play for actors. Um, it's all about the characters. It's all about the minds and hearts of these sort of quiet, maybe some would say insignificant lives. But um, I, I, f I love stories that are uh, about quiet, insignificant lives. I The play reminded me, I, I thought Hamish um, 
it reminded me of, I, I, I like short stories, and I've been reading a lot of Chekhov short stories, and um, I, I have for a long, long time. There's something Chekhovian about these characters. And in fact, there's a wonderful passage that sort of harkens to the cherry orchard that one char character gets to say. Um, I love the short stories of you know Alice Munro and, and people like that who just sort of take Polaroids of people's lives that you would pass by and not think twice about what was going on. Um, <laughs> And, and I just love that. Uh, it's, it's a little, uh, we get to be voyeurs into these simple people who are dealing with unspeakable loss. That was a very good answer for a very simple question. Uh, and uh, Oh, give me a minute. <laughs> uh, so then for, for the all three of the cast members here, what was your first reaction when you actually did read the script for the first time? Because it touches on so many different levels of, of you know, there's a lot of comedic effect, uh, comedic relief um, written into it. But I wonder too, uh, Norbert, your character specifically, how much of that is you bringing bringing the comedy to it um, versus uh, what's written on the page? But that's a second question. Again, my first question is, what was your first impression? Uh, I was really moved. I re I found it incredibly relatable. Um, I I. I'll just be very candid and say that the, the, the character is a father of a of a young girl between the ages of 17 and 23. We see her. I have three daughters myself. My oldest daughter is 20. I have a 17-year-old. I could relate. I thought it was extremely authentic, the dialogue. Very funny. I, I don't know how this approaching middle-aged man gets the vernacular of teenage girlhood so spot on. Uh, he has two daughters himself. Um, I just recognized immediately Hamish has two daughters as well. There's the, the, this guy has a uh, uh, just a, a open, bleeding heart full of love for his child, and and that was relatable. He's an actor and an acting teacher. The character is. Um, there were some wonderfully funny scenes where I get to kind of send up a little bit the uh, cliche of the acting teacher, the sort of the the narcissist <laughs> acting teacher. Um, the jokes were really funny. Hamish also has, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to keep on raving about Hamish, but like I first loved him on, on The New Adventures of Old Christine. You remember him on that show? Like he's so funny. And there's, 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 but there's proper jokes in the show um, and not jokes that, that have punchlines, but that come out of the situations in the characters. And I just, I, I really responded to that. I found it incredibly sad. I can remember reading it with my husband, and I couldn't. There were scenes I, neither of us could get to the end of without crying. And because I thought it was, I thought it was very, very beautiful, very sad, very funny. I agree with what Norbert said that there were jokes that were coming out. It all comes out of such a real place, and these people are all. Imagine if I started crying now, how embarrassing that would be. I'm not going to. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but Look at the all picture the on the wall over here. Are so are so brave and sympathetic and full of, I mean, it's it's the most awful situation that uh, I am also a mother with two children and one teenage daughter, but you can't, the, the setting and the situation is so awful, but there's such beautiful, specific moments of sort of joy and hope and that I hadn't read a play like that. And also, without giving things away, the time structure, I was just very excited about when I first read it. So I felt, and I had, this is the first play I've done since I've come to New York, and I haven't done very many before. So it felt like, wow, to be able to do this brand new, exciting, delicate thing felt just really exciting. And the part of Christina is so, well, she, she's a very unhappy, I mean, I don't want to give too much away because you're all going to see it. You're all going to bring lots of people to see it. But um, she is it doesn't have such a bleeding heart as her husband and her ex-husband. She finds it much harder to communicate or work out what she's feeling. She's a bit more withdrawn and cold and confused. And so there's a huge amount of regret for her. And there's a huge amount of unspoken. And I hadn't played, I haven't, it's, I haven't really, I'm garrulous and haven't really played a character like that before. And I found that very exciting and a challenge. Mm. And the cast, I mean, the whole situation seemed like a dream, so I didn't want to get too excited. But when I read it, I was gobsmacked. I was sort of, couldn't stop thinking about all of them. And yeah. Such a good word. <laughs> you just told me you're fired. Oh. 
<laughs> I thought I was told that I'd be told at the end of previews, but I didn't know it would be in front of everyone. But okay, <laughs> I echo everything that they said, um, and I, I, I am a big believer that true and great comedy arises out of necessity. Um, you know, we we laugh in the darkest moments because we have to, otherwise we implode and die. You know, it's why people laugh at funerals or like um, when something terrible happens, you somehow get the giggles and it feels so inappropriate, but I think it's sort of your body's reaction to attempting to process something that's impossible to process in real time. And when I read Hamish's play, it's so, so heartbreaking in the most beautiful and like Dolly said, delicate way, but it's also so fucking funny because it has to be, because if it mm. wasn't, mm. these people would die. They'd kill themselves because there's no reason to go on living otherwise. And, and I think these very sort of hard humans who are faced with this incredible tragedy and and the need to process their own guilt and blame surrounding it. Um, Hamish has just done this incredible and beautiful job of writing the way that they navigate this story and the way that they navigate um, trying to climb over their grief and continue living. Um, Is this all new for you, Hamish? It's very accurate. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> can't, can't imagine the play you guys all must be imagining. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. We're really just setting it up for all of us to finish. You're just over here looking, you. looking at Scott with this weird look on his face. I was like, is this the first time he's heard any of you guys talk about him? No. no. Those are just the faces he makes. I, oh, I, fair I, enough. I, I, I just wanted to say one, one other thing, too. Something about the play that struck me oh, right, right away is it's total lack of cynicism it's it's i i i, I don't know ab about all of you but it was it was a hard year uh <laughs> in a lot of ways and um for a lot of us it felt like the bottom really fell out um we were uh culturally socially in a whirly gig i think um <clears throat> Uh, in a lot of ways, and, and so this idea um, that a group of people come together to to hold each other up, I suppose, um, it's a play about community, At really at the end of the day. Um, it's about eight characters who get through something through and with each other. Um, we all need each other up on the stage, and we need each other without cynicism. And I, that hit me real hard when I read the play. Maybe it was at the time that I got the play, but um, that's what I most love about the Whirly Gig. Hmm. So all, all of the actors, Scott, have, have very long and, and illustrious, even the writer, uh, acting careers in front of, of TV and um, you know the camera for TV and movies. Is there anything that, as a director, do you have to adjust what you do based on what they bring because they have a different background versus a traditional theater-only type of actor, or does that even exist? Um, I, or you just say, have at it, here's the words. Yeah, you know, everyone is its own animal, you know what I mean, when you get a group of people together and you try to, I mean, I personally try to make it seem like everybody is in the same world. And so sometimes you have to nudge somebody in one way, uh, you know, or in another way to sort of make sure that everybody feels like they live in the same world. Because that's, in my opinion, when you watch a show or a movie or something like that, if it's off balance, it doesn't seem authentic. It seems a little fraudulent. And so I really work hard thinking about a world, and, and every world is different. Sometimes you do a very different tone, and really just about like, you know, the sort of tone that you're after. And and uh, uh, as far as like people being, in, I mean, talent is talent, and technique is technique, I guess. And so some people who are incredibly talented have to figure out things in their technique to sort of, you know, help them out. And so you just try to help people figure out the balance, and sometimes you hit them. 
but it's always with <laughs> it's always with love. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean that's the that's my I mean that's always my goal. Like whether whether a show works or not for me is when I watch it, I feel like ah, it feels like I'm watching a world, you know, mm -hmm. that where everybody inhabiting it is in the same one. Yeah, the person I went to see it with commented afterwards. She said to me, she said, I felt like I just watched a movie. And it was, it was, and I was thinking about that comment. I was thinking about the whole thing over the weekend because I saw it on Friday night. And it sat with me for a couple of reasons. Being a parent myself, you know, it hit me on that level. But then just in terms of just being damn good theater, like it was on that level. Um, and then my friend's comment about being a movie, it just occurred to me why I, why we felt that based on what you said is that everything was so perfectly complementary of each other, including you know, the actors uh, were all on the same level. The set was not intrusive, but complemented everybody's performance. Um, so there's actually no question here. I just wanted to, well, to add you on know, to that. It, I thought it, it was the, great. It, you know, but it has a, the, the story has a sort of, it unfolds in a cinematic way in that, you know, I mean, not a lot of playwrights write three line scenes. Do you know what I mean? And I think that like that was a challenge in a way to sort of do it. But I knew that they were essential to to capture the sort of absurdity of of uh, of the situation. And um, so I think maybe, you know, it unfold and there's no blackouts. I decided to not have any blackouts in it and try to figure it out. It, it took. I think the actors wanted to kill me. But it took a while, but um, I think now we're <laughs> it all sort of worked out. Oh no, it was it was wonderful. I mean, g along those lines with no blackouts, like the, the uh, hello audience. I will tell you what's going on. The the stage turns right, so you're looking at a scene, and then that scene moves up stage while another scene comes downstage, and or someone sitting in a tree, like Zasha sits in a tree for what seems like. What, an hour, forever. yeah, it's twenty, like 20 hour. minutes, and the tree limb itself <laughs> lifts up, so you're good thirty, forty feet off the stage at some point. Well, it's <laughs> like sixty, seventy feet. Twenty-five, like, but like she's stoned, so <laughs> it's yeah. at another twenty. Fake stoned, remember? Yeah, uh, fake stoned, fake stone, like right. fake news. Right. Do, do you, what do you guys do? I mean, what do you guys do when you're waiting? I guess to come back on is—is is there any like anything you have to do to just not fall off that branch? In the tree? Yeah. What do we do? We stare at the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Johnny and I just people watch. Because we can't, we, can't, we can't say anything, because you know, we don't want to pull focus from the scenes below us. But we just, wa yeah, we just watch people in the audience. Have you ever noticed anything unusual? You're like, that guy's picking his nose? I ha no one's done anything super embarrassing yet, but there's still time. She tells us there's people in the audience that aren't there just to terrify us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other night it was Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, last night it was Judith Light. <laughs> 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 Terrifying Judith White. <laughs> well, but you know, you, I actually thought I saw her last night. They're supposed to be looking in somebody's window the whole time. Now I know, so I found <laughs> out like, what really is going on. Is your character motivation <laughs> to find Judith Light? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I get Where that. In the world is Judith Light? <laughs> that would be like, that would be a funny thing. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess in terms of the audience itself, though, have you ha you've only been open for for a couple days now? But have you received any unusual audience feedback or things that you did or may or may not have expected from this? Any of you? I wasn't ready for um, the volume of the talking in the audience. Like in the matinee, I just had someone go, oh my god. <laughs> but they were sitting, they were so close. And then you hear like, is that the one from? Like they're trying to work out who you are. Or the chatting, I wasn't so prepared for. Just oh, you mean just the audience poor, just poor etiquette of, of, yeah, just of New York to audience? Each other. Yes. It's just because we're terrible Americans with no manners. We're <laughs> <laughs> not used to it. I remember the first time I came to the theater in America, and I was so surprised, and that hasn't happened yet, which is devastating, is that someone came on stage and everyone went, woo! <laughs> which does not happen in London. It was Orlando Bloom in Romeo and Juliet, and he didn't have a shirt on, and people were just screaming. So I, I'm I, I was one of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm devastated that I haven't even got a it was Orlando Bloom. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Okay. Don't without his shirt. Come out without your shirt on. They might, they might cry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try that on tomorrow. I'm, I'm fascinated sometimes because, like, uh, when I do, when we do shows, and I always I so, I sort of know they're working in a weird way when sometimes the audience talks.
talks at it. Or they, yeah. or like, I always love in the show when about that key. Do you know what I mean? Like at the, you, you won't understand this, but like they say, oh, he's locked the door. You know, they, they sort of say the line with him as if they're so into it that they recite yeah. it um, with him. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. And there's another scene we won't give away. Um, between Norbert and another... They gentleman. won't really remember the scene okay, if well, you anyway, give it away. Well, you hear I mean, you the know. audience go, <gasps> which I love. Yeah, there's a lot of gasping. It's interesting. But I think that means people are with it, and I find that exciting, because that's part yeah, of... Either that know. or my overacting offended them so much. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, <gasps> I can't believe he did that again. You can feel the engro that people are engrossed when they react. You know, It's like they have like a visceral reaction. They can't control themselves. <laughs> they have to say something. It's it's interesting, I think, and part of the. I always say the audience is the extra, the next character. You know, it's like a character mm -hmm. in a play. An audience just, you never know what you're going to get any night. You know, it's talking uh, Norbert to your overacting. Um, oh gee, oh, Manetli, it gets that. its own you subject heading. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, on my tablet, I have overacting right here. Uh, no, obviously it's working well. Um, you've won <laughs> you've won a couple <laughs> Tony Awards and, and such. You're overacting. Um, <laughs> Wow. You so yeah. walked into that. You um, this is a question for you and I guess Hamish and uh, Scott too. Uh, so the char your character is is very eccentric. eccentric. Um, how much, that was my earlier question I guess that we didn't answer. How much of that did you bring to the page and how much of it was written uh, on script, in the script already? Well, that's, that's the strange thing about what we do. There's a sort of a, 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 a silent, I don't know amalgamation something something that happens that's what you, that's what you look for I, I I don't know how to answer that other than to say um, of course it's all coming from the page it has to start with the words I you know I I haven't uh, improved anything I've added nothing the play is so well written um, so I don't I haven't added anything to it um, in that the language is there um, so anything that I'm doing. Um, my imagination has been sparked from from what's right there on the page. Um, it's my job to sort of find within me, Norbert, what uh, what I my sensibility of of Michael, this this man. Um, you know, it's 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 not something that I, I really tr try not to overthink it. Um, you you learn it really really well. You learn it perfectly as best you can. Hamish is, is a real stickler about, you know, uh, there's actually not an and in that sentence. There's actually, um, and he's dead right. Every time he's dead right. Um, there's a reason that the and is not there. The line is funnier without it, or it's odder without it. Um, you try to, to do exactly what's on the page and then um, uh, let, let go and try to fly. I, I, I will say that, uh, like, I, I so enjoy acting myself, and I love being an actor, and I love other actors so much, and so I want to, if I'm going to force someone to go up on a stage and say something that I've written, I hope it will give them joy to do it, and joy to the audience to receive it, so... Uh, you know, I do tend to write sort of bigger characters who have large emotional lives. And, and you know, when I go on stage, I want to make people laugh and I want to make people cry. And so I wouldn't want to just, you know, pay, what is that? Play it for, pay it forward, whatever. Yeah, pay, it forward. To, yeah. pay it forward. Yeah, I didn't know what I was saying. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> and uh, so. That's, you know, uh, and, and certainly at, while putting together this cast, I think the consideration was we want people who are going to eat up the stage, you know, that are going to go for it because then everyone in the house is going to be having a good time at the same time. So, um, so, and I just, you know, Norbert is, Norbert's, Norbert's doing it. Um, and so it's really great, and Zasha as well, and Dolly really too. Except you just fired her. <laughs> <laughs> is there so from your perspective, Scott? Is there anything that I mean? You're just there to be like, yep, check all the boxes, or you know, you're a director. How much do you direct these wonderful people? Um, I don't know. 
<laughs> I don't know how other people do it. <laughs> I guess I, you know, I always speak my mind. I'm honest. You know, I try to offer help and insight and, you know, try not to hover too much and, you know, let people have a little um, leeway. But I also, uh, I try to be really honest because I want everybody to excel and I want everybody in the theater to feel every performance. And, uh, and also I ha I'm dedicated to the play and Hamish, and so, yeah. I mean, Scott does an unbelievable time, uh, d d unbelievable job of uh, changing my diapers and, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, soothing me. It's unbelievable during the show. It, uh, uh, I, I'm just like a wiggly, wiggly baby. But uh, he, I mean, the way that he has uh, uh, mentored me and cared for me during this process, uh, it was just been uh, unspeakable invaluable. I'm so grateful to him. So audience, if you guys uh, have any questions, we have two mics in the aisles, so please uh, start to line up. You can ask anybody anything. Um, I want to go back, though, to, to the set real fast. I think it's kind of interesting that for these shows that have such a highly highly involved technical aspect, not that this is all technical, but you're, you're very reliant on the turntable. Do you have a contingency plan? Like, what if that turntable messes up, screws up, has it screwed up? Do we? Do we, Scott? Don't, don't, don't ask that question. Is there I don't, it's, it's right here. I mean, it's look, you yeah. know, uh, we have very experienced people working on all of the aspects of the production. And um, yeah, I mean, it does rely on it. But you know, if God forbid something happened, they would still do the play. You know, uh, the the stage is actually, it's interesting, the stage is raked. So like you can see behind, like you could see what's going on. So I don't, I don't think that if they just did the play, it would just be as wonderful. You just wouldn't see my, my staging, which is really just enhancing the play. Right. Raked you know, means the play is, one, is amazing. So it's the, the play, the, the staging just gives it a little something. But even when we did a when we did a workshop of the play and we were all just sitting around the table and reading the play, it was obvious to us that, you know, just the the actual play is so beautiful. So I guess if something happens, thanks a lot. <laughs> blame me. That's, I'm going to call blame you. Just blame me. I'm going to wake you up <laughs> and your child. <laughs> That's just mean. <laughs> they're they're young. Let him sleep. Uh, okay, Zasha. Um, uh, well, everybody on the stage actually, and we'll get to all of you. Uh, Zasha, you've got a, a long family history of of being in performing arts and whatnot. Your father. Yes, that's that shouldn't be a surprise. Um, your father, David uh, David Mamet, founded Atlantic Theater Company here, attached to this building. Um, so you are you've never been inside Google, but you've been in the building. You said plenty of times. Um, do, does your relationship with him? Do you think this is sort of on a more general note? Has your relationship with your father being successful as he has influenced the choices that you've made as as your own, I guess, independent career? No. <laughs> Fair. Fair. All right, next question. <laughs> Norbert, seven of 11 children. Yep. Are any of them uh, as, as wonderful overactors as you are? She <laughs> my <laughs> so uh, where, where did you get your start? And I, is it a family thing? Uh, I, 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 yes, I'm the seventh of 11. I think I got my start uh, just trying to be heard over the din of <laughs> that household gave me um, <clears throat> the instrument that you hear before you. Um, <laughs> I grew up in a, a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri, and then after age seven, way out in the country in a very, very, very small town. Uh, no theater at all to speak of. Uh, my parents were devout Christians, so limited, limited music, limited film. Um, and that was a great way to be raised, actually, because uh, we just got to pretend all day long. I had to create all kinds of worlds in my head. And uh, we sang a lot. So music was really my first way into this crazy world of show. Um, but uh, then I discovered um, the theater in, in high school. And then uh, I went, went on to college and studied acting. And I've been at it ever since. Cool, Dolly. You're next, yes. Um, yes. Dolly, by the way, is my mom's name, and now I'm at working with Dolly Wells. How? It's true. I'm actually called Dorothy. Yes, you don't look anything like my mom. <laughs> no, no. Oh. 
Okay. So you're you're sweet. Like when <laughs> I just didn't want to say that when like Dolly and I have to kiss in the play a lot. But now. So I don't think of my mom. Never mind. This is getting weird. <laughs> no, keep, keep going. This is interesting. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. You yeah. Take the mic away from me. Yes. Okay. Uh, Dolly, your your father uh, John Wells, correct? Yes. Yeah. Very very successful as in his own right. Um, he would love you saying that. He's not alive anymore, so, but he was. He was very wonderful. He wasn't like very, very, very successful. But yeah, he was a, a satirist and a mm -hmm. comedian. He started up a magazine called Private Eye that lampoons most people. <laughs> um, and he was an actor and he translated operas and he was a journalist. He did millions of things and he thought towards the end of his life that he did them very badly. He thought he should have just done one thing. He started off as a teacher at Eton. He taught French and German and he... Um, at night, he would climb out of the window and go to the establishment, which was this sort of trendy comedy place that Peter Cook, this comedian, would put nights on, and my dad would do it with him. And one night, it was in one of the red tops, one of the bad newspapers. It said, Eton master peddles smut on the London stage. So he got <laughs> asked to come and see the headmaster, and they said, you have to decide whether you would like to be a teacher or peddling smut. And he decided to peddle smut. <laughs> <laughs> and so for the last, for the end of his life, he thought he should have carried on stuck to being a teacher. But um, but yeah. And but that, did that influence you to, to yes, choose a career? Yes, because when I was like? very young, he, his most thing that he was, did that was most sort of noticed was he imitated Mrs. Thatcher's husband, Dennis Thatcher. In the West End, he wrote a play that he put on and it was on, lasted for two years. And every night he would make up whatever was going on in the news. And so I would go and watch him do it. And I can remember standing on the stage at about eight or nine, just thinking, this would be really fun. And then at night, all his friends would come home. And I was saying, noticing that yesterday, I've got a son who's 12, and we were doing FaceTiming and doing dares in the theater. <laughs> and anything that he asked Dasha to do or Hamish to do or the crew to do, they were doing. And I was thinking, there's no way, help, there is no way he's not going to be an actor now. because. Actors are just so nice to children. You were stuff. having so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> they were great. This was like 15 minutes before we went on stage, by the way. Um, so yes, he did influence me, definitely, yeah. And then Hamish, your mother, who was here in the audience, yeah? My mom right is here. in the house. There she is. Who is your mother? Tell us about her. Uh, my mom's a lady named Kristen Linklater. Uh, she has a technique called the Linklater technique, uh, which is taught in universities across this country to help actors uh, fill a space and also uh, be great artists. And uh, so that's um, what w w smut she peddles. And, uh, uh, and w when... Uh, when my mommy had me, I gotta tell a long story now. We, uh, when my mommy had me, just because she's here, uh, she had a, a good university job at NYU and, um, and she was sort of like in a good financial place to <laughs> raise a child by herself and in, in New York. And, um, and then uh, and when I got to be about two, she was like, all right, that's enough of that. And she went off to start this theater company and we moved into called Shakespeare and Company in the Berkshires where this play is set. Uh, and uh, we moved into uh, like an actor commune, moved into this abandoned mansion that was haunted and it had uh, maybe electricity, but certainly not hot water. It was built by Edith Wharton. And so her ghosts, they were like go they were real, real ghosts. Yes. Uh, and you would hear the footsteps of the maids on the top floor at, at night, and then sometimes a scream and something like that. Uh, Hamish, uh, where is this play? Uh, the, it's, uh, it's, it's, this is this play. I'm finally casting myself in a role. <laughs> uh, and, um, and she, and we, you know, she, uh, we, there was no money. There were just, just like uh, ghosts, but <laughs> she, but the, but the idea was, you know, we're going to make a great American Shakespeare troupe. And uh, I think, and that's what I grew up with, was sitting out on the lawn and watching the Shakespeare happening all summer. And, uh, and that's, 
And like you were saying, you know, actors are the best, the best people in the world. Uh, not a lot of people know that. <laughs> uh, but the, but when you're a kid, you, uh, they want an audience. You know, they're desperate for an audience. Those actors and little children love to see people dancing around, doing things in pumpkin pants. Uh, so uh, I, that's she made my mom made me. <laughs> my mom made me uh she made me a home um and it was in the theater um so i'm really grateful to her <laughs> is that the first tear shed in a google talk i i think it might be actually uh, that was really, thank you, thank you for that, and thank you for, we cry. Did, you, did, you, did the two of you sit around and cry? We just, uh, Everyone needs a good cry session. Let's go see the show, it's wonderful. Yeah, actually, uh, that was the one, the one, th the one comment I got from uh, an audience member after, it was like, hey, did you write the show? It was like at the end of the thing, hey, did you write the show? I was like, yeah, I wrote the show. He's like, are you crying? I was like, yeah, I'm crying. You're crying at your own play? <laughs> And I said to him, why, did he go, why the fuck do you think I wrote it? <laughs> <laughs> I like a cry. Everybody loves and, a cry. And it's so great, you know, when we have like two show days, I get two cries in it. It's fabulous. So do you, you still go see the show? Are you going to see every show, you think? I, I go as often as I possibly can. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 also the audience teaches you so much about the play, so it's wonderful to get a good, good variety of focus groups. I mean, it's, it's very heavy for the characters. All the characters are deeply, deeply flawed, which makes them all work together. Uh, and so, I guess, for the, again, the cast members, do you guys do anything specific for this to help you prepare for, I guess, the emotional journey you have to go on? We bounce on a trampoline. <laughs> Twice. Everyone has to do two bounces. That's the, the extent. The play, we don't, well, I find that really hard talking about that sort of thing beforehand because I find that this sounds too English but it's cringy that's just what I find so I wouldn't probably say but I think that the play once you get on stage and start speaking Hamish's words in this play that Scott has made beautiful for us to be in and do and know what we're doing I don't I think you just have to get on with it I don't know that's what exactly right I I I, I don't want to keep pointing out Miss Kristen, the brilliant Kristen Linklater over there, but the first textbook, most actors that go through training programs in this country have to do Link, Linklater work. It was the first textbook that I bought in my undergrad program, and I did the technique all through undergrad school, and so to be here now with her as an audience member and her son as a playwright is just huge for me. Um, but so how do I prepare? I, I think you know, back when I was 19 years old and I read, you know, her work and, and how to free the natural voice and all these types of things, I think I was preparing, you know, 35 years ago uh, for, for, what I, for what I have to do. But, but Dolly is exactly right. There's really no, you show up, you make sure you have your sleep, have your protein, make sure you're rested, warm up, and then get out of your head. There's no way th to start yeah. the player through it except through it. And and actors try to find so many ways of how not to begin. None of us want to start. Yeah, it's it's, like right, it's yeah. the worst. Starting is the worst. Mm -hmm. and, and this is true, I think, I'm think i sure, from Olivier down to an overacting ham like me. Um, there's You want to find something, oh, please don't let it have to happen again. Is there any way that I can get to the curtain call without actually having to do yeah. all of these things? Yeah. And there's not. There's not. I l absolutely love that about acting. It's like every day, it's a microcosm of living your life, right? One foot in front of the other. Get out there. The place starts. Open up and move through it. You know, there's really no way to prepare. And, and also, it's, I mean, having more experience with television, it feels like it's quite, it feels like quite a good lesson, well, just for me, in how to try and live life when you're on stage, which is just basically listen very carefully to what the other people are saying to you and only listen to them. And then when you're... And don't jump at all ahead, like even like a second ahead, because you give yourself a, a, pretty much a heart attack. Because <laughs> you're thinking, oh, my God, I don't, know, I don't know where I am. I don't know anything. So you just have to stay very, very much in the moment and listen and think. And I think that's... And feel... But that, you don't really have to feel because it's done for you. I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think feeling is good. Yeah. So, <laughs> but he's written it very well, it so happens. that it's it's yeah. like half of it's done for you. Exactly. But I I also think echoing you know, hearkening back to what Hamish said before that he he wants us all to have a good time. I think I think um, he really accomplished that. And the writing is you know we as actors we are we are hams. That's why we do what we do, and we want to go on stage and we want to make you laugh and we want to make you cry and we want to make ourselves cry mm -hmm. for you and we want to feel all the feelings but i think at the end of the day and hamish has said this to us so often throughout the process that like just have have fun you know remember and i try and remember that every time i go out on stage every night just that i do this because i fucking love it mm -hmm. and and it's this deep deep love of the game because it is quite miserable at times mm -hmm. and terrifying and sort of sort of awful but, but we it's like a compulsion you know we do it because we have to otherwise we would have all been bankers um and so to remember that to be incredibly present and listen to the people that you're on stage with and then also just like even in the scenes where you're you're weeping and crumpled in a in a ball on the floor, which I do too much in this play, um, <laughs> just to remember that you love it and try and um, you know take a huge bite out of that. Lovely. Uh, there's a quote actually that I found of Norbert. Do you have? Do you want to add? I to was that? just going to say one quick thing that like, you know, our I see our job as making you feel something. Like that's that's what we do, and the only way we can do that, or I mean, I have the greatest. Uh, admiration and respect for actors who are able to do that. Um, that's what I, I mean, that's the only way that I could like put my own job and make myself feel like I'm doing something worthy <laughs> is to think that like our job is to make people feel something, you know? Yeah, the, the quote I was gonna bring up here, uh, it's thrilling to be on stage and to not know, literally what the next moment is gonna bring to just submit to the not knowing of, not knowingness of it. I love that you said that. Yes. Question over here. Thanks so much for coming. Can't wait to see it. And on the topic of liking to feel things, I really appreciated how you all talked about both the sadness but also the humor in the play. And I was curious if there were any rehearsals that were particularly humorous that you could tell us about that would give us insight into the process. Yeah, I think, I think they've all been humorous. At times, you know, especially with a play that is the subject matter is so heavy, for lack of a better word, we, you have to find the humor in the process. Otherwise, we'd all just never show up for work. <laughs> so yeah, we we laugh a lot. Yeah, loads. And also, there's lines that, however many times you hear, <laughs> Norbert and I always laugh about. When someone says, who, there's a photograph on the bar, and they say, who's that? And one of the characters just says, ugly children. Because <laughs> 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 we're all so smug thinking that our children are so beautiful that we can laugh with great. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine having ugly children. <laughs> but um, there are so, and also, this sounds really annoying in actuary if we haven't sounded like that already, is that <laughs> Scott and Hamish have put together a group of people that really, really like each other oh, yeah. and really find each other very funny. And so, which is really lucky because then you have moments like I have a moment when I have to lie on a bed and I'm listening to two or three scenes and you're listening to them again and again and again but you're feeling so lucky that you're not only listening to really powerful and interesting and moving and funny and in peculiar words but you're also listening to them being done by really talented people who you like so that's quite a few things all happening at the same time that you feel quite pleased about so because we all get on very well and because everybody I can't think of anyone that doesn't make me laugh. We do all laugh quite a lot. It's awful working with people who don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, we've all been in a situation where we've worked with people without a sense of humor, and that's always hard. But uh, anyway, but yeah, I always look for people, actors. I'm always attracted to people with senses of humor. You know, it's my love it. I thought we were going to get in trouble the other night. We were in our tech rehearsal. I don't know. We were on like hour nine of just going cue to cue. It's, it's just drudgery. It's just awful. And it was like our eighth day in a row or something. And, you know, the play is is 
it has a lot of joy. There's a lot of sadness in it. And we just we get into these giggle fits. And I think, it, you know, your defenses are down. Your body gets tired. And it's always, a, you, I mean, Hamish, you know, you're doing Shakespearean tragedies. Intention. The end of those plays, it's so hard to do them with a straight face. You're either all in, you're all Oh, in. yeah, I remember that. It was funny. No, you guys are having fun. I love I've watching got, moments like yeah, that. I've got an answer. I love when people. Wait, I just, love it. We are you just talking about when I said "go." <laughs> I don't think I don't think Hamish liked it very much, but I really loved it. <laughs> oh, when Norbert. That's an answer that I hadn't remembered. Norbert started, and I must be very gullible. But Grace, the girl who lies in the bed, he was doing what he said was his best English accent for me and Grace. And I was, I was, so, I was so amazed. He said it was for an audition. I said, Dolly, I have to go on an audition. I have to do a British accent. I think I've, I think I've nearly got it. Would you just have a listen to me for a few lines? <laughs> and so I started talking like this. <laughs> I think I've just about got it. <laughs> Um, to be or no to be. Uh, no, that one's not right. To be. Uh, to be. And I had her going, like, it was the dumbest joke in the world. Everybody else knew it was the dumbest joke. And she's like, oh, oh God, he's really terrible. But she was buying it. And I was being so nice. I kept saying, have you got um, anything that I could help? Just maybe, I, where's he from? <laughs> and, <laughs> and me and Grace were just pushing each other's leg. I was really scared said, for him. I said, well, it's an interesting character. He was born in London, but when he was two, <laughs> he moved to Utah. <laughs> but when he was three and a half, he moved back to London. And then he moved to Birmingham. Oh, and then he moved to Birmingham, Birmingham when he was six. Yeah. So I'm trying to get all these little sounds. And she's nodding, going, oh, OK, let me see if I can get my head. I was like, are you serious? You're buying this shit. I, can, I was so disappointed. Dolly Wells is the most gullible human being <laughs> who's ever existed. Every night, Noah Bean and I go, well, Noah will be like, hey, Zosh, did you, did you hear who's in the audience? And Dolly will be like, I know you're joking. You're jo who? <laughs> who? No, I know you're joking, but who is it? <laughs> Judith Light. Well, thank you guys so much for coming in. Uh, you, the, the, the Worldly Gig is now at, um, in the middle of a, or at the beginning of a limited run, which opened May 4th, going through June 11th. And everybody, please uh, help me give them a round of applause.